Welcome to episode 298 of the DFO Rundown, brought to you by our sports betting partner, just in time for the 2024 playoffs, Bet365. We'll be here with Bet365 to provide you all the news, analysis, lines, and betting options for the playoffs until only one team is left standing. So get in the game at Bet365. I'm Jason Greger, Frank Saravalli uh, joining us uh, from Utah. Where of course uh, they had uh, their their welcoming to the team. The players are trotted out. Uh, they're you know having fun. Frank, it, uh, you know I read a lot of the comments. Coaches, players, uh, they uh, they probably could not have been more warmly welcomed than they were in Utah. It would be impossible. It was top notch. I mean, every part of it. From the moment the players stepped off the plane, there was five hundred plus local youth hockey players waiting at the hangar with signs. They opened up the hangar doors and it's just mountains everywhere. It's beautiful. And then the arena was electric there. When I got there two plus hours before the event, the line to get in, it was a free event. So not only was it free, but they had free food, free drinks, free hot dogs. And the line was snaked around the building. NHL jerseys of all colors and denominations. Fans can't wait to get a glimpse. And then they had, you go in, they had the ice down. They had the boards up. They had a stage in the back, exactly where the curtain would be with the seats that aren't going to be usable for the first season or two. And the place just exploded when these players came out and were introduced. Now, those seats that aren't usable, Frank, could you could you put a big screen up somewhere so if people want you know and charge a lower price and have people in the building or no? I mean, theoretically, you could. They do have one of those giant scoreboards for the Jazz, so like, I don't even know that you need to put anything up, but you would need to acknowledge, especially in the upper bowl, that there's one end of the ice that you just can't see from. Yeah. Right. Which is okay. Might just be an atmosphere thing too. come on and add to the noise. Well, that's Um, what I was thinking. But I think they're going to cap it at 12,000, which is roughly what the attendance was last night. And I traded messages with a current Coyotes slash Utah player. And he just messaged me last night and said. Feels like we're back in the NHL, (laughs) which is. He wasn't throwing shade. It was just, this is what an NHL team feels like. This is what it feels like to be a big deal. Yeah. And couldn't agree more. Well, when you, when you hear more of the stories about, you know, how things were ran in Arizona, you know, it wasn't just a facility that maybe was a a tad below uh, NHL standards, right? Yeah. um, It was less than ideal on a million fronts, but I actually asked GM Bill Armstrong and Andre Tournier about that yesterday. Just the feeling of a a fresh start, a blank slate and stepping off the plane like that. That has to be one of the emotions that they experienced is, hey, you know what? Things have been screwed up for the for Bill Armstrong for the last four years. Andre Tournier coaching a team that has done it with one hand tied behind its back. And now I'm excited to see how both of these people do in their jobs with actual resources, with goals and aspirations and the ability to do it the right way. I mean, it's one thing to evaluate the success or failures of the team in Arizona, but it's another thing to evaluate it based on the significant issues that were at play. And now that those are seemingly taken care of now, let's go, let's hit the ground running. And what about the name? Like, did you, did you talk to Smith? Like, are they really not going to have a name? Like I've seen a lot of the names that they've, they've put out there. And um, I I don't see why you can't come up with a name and, and just make a choice over the next few months. And, and then, say, hey, you know what, we get to June 1st. That's a long time. I, I don't see any other name that you're going to be able to, to make up that somehow you'll need an extra 12 months for. Like To me, I just think you're overthinking it if you need that long to come up with a name. 
So he reiterated last night at the event that it will say Utah on their jerseys. He he said it, it will say Utah on our jerseys this season. Now, he didn't say definitively one way or the other whether they're going to have the name in place for the season or not. But he did confirm again that they're going to put eight teams in a bracket and fans are going to vote bracket style. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be the fans choice. Obviously the eight teams that make it into that bracket are going to be the team's choice. And then that would kind of signal to me that they're open to any of those eight names and are ready to roll based off of that. Okay. Well, so they, well, then there shouldn't, I don't, I don't think you can spread a bracket voting out and keep the interest if you're doing it once a month. So, um, you know, you do that and, uh, and you move on, which is fine. Um, I think, you know, it's probably smart from a marketing standpoint. Year one, you're going to have Utah on the jersey, Frank. Uh, and then uh, in year two, you'll come out with a new jersey and uh, you'll get fans who bought the first one, buying the second, and some who now they have options. So, yeah, by, by the way, like fans were flocking to buy merchandise in the arena last night that literally just has an NHL shield and says Utah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. They were all over it. I guess yeah. it's going to be a collector's item soon. Um, and, and a quick thing on the arena. Um, so they don't have plans to build a new arena. Basically what the plan is, is a set, I think a $700 million complete overhaul of the current arena that they're in. They're going to blow out the walls on the side of the arena and make it big enough. So the, the footprint or floor big enough so that you can then move back the seats and it will be 17,000 for hockey without any issues and clear sight lines. And Inside, how long would that, like, are you going to be able to, let's say you finish next season, but what if you make the playoffs next year? Now you have even less time to do it. Well, they say they can accomplish it over a series of three off seasons. Now, remember that's both the jazz and the Utah team that is going to impact but they've been able to do it. And like, I've seen a billion dollar renovation at Madison square garden. It's, it's not the same arena anymore. So no. we've seen what they did at the old key arena in Seattle. That's not, that's a complete overhaul and renovation. So Ryan Smith owns the arena, uh, part of his plan. And if you are here, you can understand and see it, which is right next to my hotel here. Downtown is a giant, indoor outdoor mall and essentially the plan is to connect this with the arena which is three blocks away or so and have basically one long entertainment district that makes its way to the arena and culminates there and look um it's exciting this is a beautiful place i've never been to utah before never been to salt lake and i was blown away by the support like these players, they loved every second of it. Oh, and yeah. they did a great job endearing themselves to the fans as well. Going player to player with the microphone. And even the guys that are uncomfortable had a little something to say. Oh, yeah. Liam O'Brien. Mabel just though. wanted to say hello, Frank. She yeah, been, uh, I, I saw. I got a little so Mabel. I have to give her a little bit of TLC. She just turned two. So she's, she's very excited. So she needed Good. to say hello. So we'll say hello. Now big, she's a big rundown fan. Yeah, no, no, she is. She likes. Uh, she'll just sit on the floor and listen. So it's a, uh, it's very nice. Um, basically, I think she was coming in because she wanted food. But um, yeah, you know what? I think it's. I can see how it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be quite exciting. The fan base. Obviously, they're going to have no shortage of season tickets. Um, I'll be curious how they price them. Um, you know, it's a supply and demand. I bet you those lower bowl tickets are going to be pretty expensive when you only got twelve thousand. So you know what? If they have what are they think twenty nine thousand deposits, well. No, that's over uh, double capacity, so I don't think they'll have any uh, any issues getting uh, fans. And I don't know that I, I heard they were showing some of the uh, the playoff games in in the building afterwards, which makes sense. And let's get to those because uh, you know the playoffs are on, Frank. Uh, you got some fan bases freaking out after a loss, and they're you know they're bringing out the Stanley Cup if they win a game, and that's what that's what the uh, the playoffs uh, uh, does for a lot of people. Um, I guess let's start where the top seed. The team that many people picked to win the Stanley Cup is down 0-2 to the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. How concerned, and, and both losses at home, how concerned are people in Dallas, or how concerned should they be? 
I think they should be pretty concerned. Look, anytime you drop the first two on home ice, let alone to the defending cup champs, I mean, to me, there's certainly cause for concern. Does it mean it's over? No. Um, were these games really pretty much closely contested? I'd say yes. Did Vegas still control a, a huge chunk of the first two games? Yes. Um, what a tough spot, though, if you're the stars. And not, there are no excuses. You still got to beat the, you know, whether they were the eight seed or whatever they are. I, I tweeted it last night. A lineup last night, $87.2 million. That's only with 20 players. Most teams carry 21 to 23, and the cap was 83 and a half this year. You you get the ability to reinsert a close to point per game player who has Selkie creds in Mark Stone and is the heartbeat of their team. Like it's a different ball game. It just is. It's fact. It's that's not opinion. Mark Stone is a game changer for the Vegas Golden Knights. Period. End of story. Complete. Oh, hey, yeah. There's no you're not gonna get an argument from me. And it's uh although I will say in game one, they had 15 shots and scored four goals, and Dallas had 30 shots. They outshot them two to one. You know what? Uh you know, Jake Ottinger in game one didn't play to the level I think that uh, he wants or, or what they need. And you know what? Uh he was better last night, but then still let in a goal that he probably doesn't like. And he'll uh you know, he'll have to be better, uh, especially on the road. It'll be a hostile environment. And well, when you um, only honestly, score one, I'm sorry, it's not the goalie. Yeah. Well, no, hey, I don't discount that, but I'm just saying for him, if you look at um, in game one, then you could argue be the goalie and they should have won that game if the goalie does jobs. Now you're one, one, right? Like if it's a split, I don't get to, I think people are freaking out over splits in some of these markets, um, which happens. Canadian markets, Vancouver and Edmonton, people are losing their mind thinking like the sky's falling. Uh, you know, uh, we'll get to those series in a sec, but I just, I look at Dallas. You're right. The, their offense needs to uh, to generate more traffic, I think, in front of uh, Logan Thompson from the games that I've – from the uh, now I haven't watched every period of that series, but I've watched probably half of each game. And that would be the one thing I would notice is that, you know what, Dallas has probably got to get a few more uh, uh, a few more ugly goals. Like you look at some of the other, other series, Frank, and guys, you're throwing pucks on net from lots of different angles. You're getting deflections off of defensemen's – skates and you know going off through pads through screens the goalies aren't catching um just because as we know in the playoffs the teams who who generate more traffic in front you get what looks like a lot more garbage goals and i think dallas needs to do that more fair look they absolutely have to play better there's no doubt about that they don't look like the team that was a consistent beast to go up against in the regular season it's almost like Everything that I was saying about the stars being hard to play against and how their game translates immaculately to the playoffs, it's almost like they flipped the switch the other way and were like, hey, this is our time. We're going to run with this. And they're forgetting some key ingredients along the way. Uh, then we move to the Vancouver series. Uh, Demko, of course, you're the first to report that uh, Demko uh, wasn't going to play in game two. It uh, doesn't sound like he's going to play in the rest of the series. Frank and you know Vancouver loses game two, but they also set a, a record in the 15 years of the stats being tracked in the regulation o a playoff game. No team has missed the net more times than the Vancouver Canucks. They had 33 missed shots, they had 33 blocked shots, they had 84 shot attempts. Only 18 of them hit the net, right? And people are like, oh, they're PDO. I'm like, it's not their PDO people. PDO only counts shots on goal. It doesn't count shots that are missing the net. And you know, I I, I don't think Vancouver should be as concerned. As some people, yeah, obviously DeSmith isn't Demko. We all know that. That's valid, but you uh, you can't take eighty four shot attempts and only have like twenty one point nine percent of their shot attempts hit the net. Frank, that's inexcusable. Look, I was at the first two games of the series in Vancouver. I'm going to Nashville later today. I don't have much concern for the for the Canucks. I think they were right in game two and probably in a lot of ways deserve to win. There's a million things that have happened in this series that have gone against the Canucks. It feels like already game one, they survive game two 
how many wide open looks have they had that hit a stick, hit their own guy's stick and go wide. Those mm-hmm. are the missed attempts that you're talking about. I, I mean, it's not, you got to hit the net. It's a lot of them have been prime opportunities that have just squirted away somehow. The Nashville Predators were holding on for dear life in the third period. The only shot that they got in the third period of game two was the empty net goal that they had. (laughs) That's a team that had full court pressure and, and full marks to the Preds for locking it down for blocking a ton of shots. The commitment to do that uh, as their coach, Andrew Burnett said they are quote committed to the pain, which I love. All that's great, but I haven't seen anything yet that indicates to me that the Preds have been the better team in the series. No. And like Elias Patterson, he's clearly frustrated, right? Um, you know, he'll, I, I get that it's an emotional time. You, you don't want to show all of your frustration on every time. Um, yeah. You know, the body he, language of dropping to your knees after a shot that doesn't go in a great look, but that it can't be like I'm putting my head in my hands and falling to my knees. Like I was just knifed in the back. Yeah. Like it, I, I'm sure if you put that empty net shot on a stick a hundred times, he ain't missing it. That is, you know, again, like that, that was, that was uncanny for me. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, here's a, it's not like, you know, no offense. It's a, a beer league guy, right? It's a guy who's a pretty good goal. Or the, I, I saw a lot of people always oh, not good in the playoffs. My, I watched him live in the playoffs in the bubble, Frank, when he was a younger player. And he actually was quite good in that series for a young guy. Um, right now he's clearly a player that's fighting some confidence issues. And uh, you got to fight through that, though. He can't he can't let it overwhelm him like at times it looked like he did emotionally in game two. He needs to be a game breaker. And I don't mean a guy that gets off a great shot and scores. He needs to control play more. He needs to dominate more. He's not doing that right now. Uh, Oilers Kings uh, into overtime. And, uh, you know, in the three years these teams have played, the Kings are now four and one in uh, in overtime. It's the one area. Uh, that they dominate the orders of one series, but uh, LA wins the overtime games. And uh, last night is Kopitar on a very odd overtime goal. The Kings are, you know, usually you have the guy standing at the center ice line, Frank, you know, and you pass it up to him and then he deflects it and it goes into the corner. Well, if you watch the replay, that clearing pass was up at the chest. It somehow hits a stick and then goes right to Kopitar wide open in on a breakaway. And uh, he buried it, but it, it was definitely not, in the, uh, in the playbook of how you're supposed to break the puck out. Uh, that, that, no one hits that. That's going to just be an icing call. And then, you know, you reset up. But, um, you know, Edmonton, I, I thought five on five, their best players in game two were, were pretty quiet. You know, their, their fourth line, Dylan Holloway, Yanmark, and Carrick, you know, they scored two goals. You know, they did score another power play goal. But, you know, to me, the game Why the changed. disparity? Like, so you watch game one and those guys yes. were all flying. Yes. McDavid first three minutes of the game you're like up that guy's in video game mode tonight and you see hyman he does his thing why all of a sudden is there such a drastic eye test visual change from game one to game two yeah they they didn't have it like they dumped the puck in way more just they didn't feel like they played with the same connectivity or pace but really it's three three they were down three to one. Cam Talbot, people, if you haven't seen the game, you go watch the save Cam Talbot made with 21 seconds left on the power play to Rob Leon Dry Settle. I think that's the game right there. That goal goes in, Frank. It's four three. The orders have erased a two goal deficit in the second period alone. Now they're up four to three. You go into the break, you're feeling good. And I think that, like, that's LA Kings fans should remember that save because that to me, potentially, on what happens here the next five games, if by chance LA pulls off the upset, I would look back to that save has changed everything because the LA Kings were reeling and uh, Edmonton's power play, which has been deadly moving the puck around dry saddle gets a wide open look and Talbot comes across with an unbelievable save to keep it three, three. So watching game one, I was like, the Oilers aren't even, they're in a different class than the Kings watching game two. I was like, huh, is this going to be a series? Yeah, I, it's a good question. Uh, well, Edmonton, LA right now, you know what? You, you got to be good, lucky to be good, good to be lucky, whichever way you look at it, right? Like they've had some bounces, like the, the last three goals in game two. Now it was a blowout game, but you know, still, I think 
you get some goals even in garbage time, Frank. I get I think it gives some of your players confidence. I'm a big believer in that. They don't care how it goes in, it just goes in. And um, you know, you look at you know, Dowdy mishandles the puck in a breakaway. Now Skinner told me he probably thinks he could have played that better, right? Uh um, you know, he was thinking he's going backhand. Nugent Hopkins comes back and then Dowdy kind of mishandles it and it squeaks through the five hole. Skinner says he should make that save. Um, you know, the they had another one, Kempe bats it out of midair. Um, there's been a few fortuitous bounces, but I think LA's worked for them. So Edmonton just has to, I thought at times LA looked like the more desperate team to me in game two. And so we'll see how you bounce back. That's what the playoffs is for. I didn't think, I don't know if anybody picked a sweep in this series. So you shouldn't be surprised if, if each team has won a game early on, but you're right. The vast difference in how, you know, Edmonton really dominated one game and then didn't look the same. And I know there'll be lots of talk about Skinner, and that's fair. He's he's got to he's got to make a few more saves. You know, the Kempe first goal. I think that's one that he would like back, uh, no question. But I look at you know your your big guns too. Orders top six was was fairly quiet five on five in game two, and and that's just you you can't have many games like that and expect to win. When your fourth line chips in with two goals, Frank five on five, usually that should be enough to spur you to want to win a game. Okay, so you brought up Skinner, so I have to share. Last season, playoffs, 883 save percentage. This year, obviously only two games, 857. I don't think Skinner's the reason they lost game two. I think I test-wise, they weren't the same team. But do are questions about Stuart Skinner in the playoffs legitimate? I'd say probably a bit early still. Um, you know, anybody who watched uh, those games, you'd look, especially the game one, right? Like three of those goals, I don't blame on the goalie at all. So uh, when they go in off a defender skate and one of them for like 15 feet out, I don't really blame a goalie on those. So, um, but I think, you know what? He needed to make, a, now he made a big save in game one that people don't remember. It's two nothing. Arvidsson has a breakaway. Skinner stones him. Edmonton comes down, scores three nothing. And that's kind of game over. It's kind of like the Talbot save that he made at 3-3 in game two. So he did. Okay, but- he has made a big save. I think he needs to be – he has to – he needs to make a few more timely saves, I think. is totally fair. Well, as as much as the Kings were shellacked in game one, Cam Talbot escapes the first two games with a better save percentage than Stuart Skinner. Yeah, only because, you know, better save percentage because the orders put more pucks on net, right? <laughs> Like Cal, Tam, Cam Talbot actually allowed more, that. More, that's more, not more. a defense of Skinner. To me, that's an indictment. Yeah, well, but scoring chances are more. We have to look at scoring chances over just shots today now, right? Like we have chances to, to look a little bit deeper, right? And LA actually had more scoring chances than Edmonton in game one. By the way, I didn't mention it because we did. You mentioned Demko and the injury. Be real curious to see how Casey to Smith responds in Nashville in game three. He's been named the starter and rightfully so, but he definitely looked a bit nervous and shaky, especially with his rebound control in game two. Wouldn't be shocked if at some point Rick Tockett went to see lobs. And uh, Hey, what about the Colorado Winnipeg Colorado scores 10 goals on the guy? Everybody thinks is a slam dunk to win the Vesna in the first two games. You you look at how many shots uh, he faced in those two games, 67 shots. Um, how concerned are you about the Jets defensively through two games? Like, I'll, here's the stat, Frank. In two games, Hellebuck has faced 67 shots. Samsonov has played three games, and he's faced a total of 77. I get what you're saying. Um, am I concerned about Connor Hellebuck? Is that what you're asking me, essentially? Well, the Hellebuck and the Jets. To me, it's a combination. Like they were one of the best defensive teams, Frank. It was the goalie, yes, but it was also their team. And they've allowed 10 goals in two games. I'm I'm not very concerned. Hmm. I'm not saying they're gonna win the series or I, they were my pick to start. But you're also like some credit needs to be given to the abs. They are a high octane, fast, skilled, deep team that can score. So it's it's a clash of two styles, and one's gonna win out. 
it seems like even though the Jets won game one, that so far the stylistic advantage is going to Colorado because of how how many goals have been put on the board, frankly. Yeah. So we'll uh I'm uh very like you look at the uh they've outshot them by an average, Frank, of twelve shots per game. So it's about seventy seven to fifty three mm-hmm. so far. So um I, I just don't think that's a recipe for success uh long term. If if you're gonna give up that much, almost forty shots a game, um, to a high octane team. Like they're gonna have to find a way to slow them down a little bit. That's all. Like I don't even with the best goalie in the league, it's clear it's hard to limit the offense if you're continually giving up high danger chances and a lot of shots. Yeah. Uh Toronto, Boston Swayman after the game. Hey. I don't want to rest. I want to play. He's won two games. Allmark's lost. And although I don't think Allmark was the reason they lost by any stretch of imagination. But what do you make of that? I, I'm not surprised. Goalies want to play. Players want to play. Yeah, um, wait. Uh, breaking Montgomery, news. Goalie wants to play. What are you trying yeah. to tell me? Do you think Montgomery will go back to Swayman? Or does he go to Allmark in game four? I think he sticks with Swayman. I mean, look. Oh, you think he's going to stick with Swayman now? For right now, I mean... You're up two to one in the series, and the guy who's won you the two, yeah, is up again. He's got a nine fifty five save percentage through the first two appearances. I'm sorry, I'm not taking him out. If he's just okay, or even if they win, I might still consider going to Allmark for game. If I can do the math, five. I can agree with that. Yes, yeah. I agree. Even if I he's can... just, even if he wins, I might go to Allmark in game five. Yes. But for four to get a three to one lead, I'm going with Swayman. Yeah. And uh, Brad Marshawn, man. Right. I don't know if, if you have a kitchenette where you're staying or not, but if you did, you could go right in there. You could pull a few pots and pans out of the kitchen and just slam them together. Cause right now that's Brad Marshawn. He's just in the Maple Leafs kitchen. He's just rattling their pots and pans and they got no answer. He is, he has absolutely got in the head of them. You look at the, uh, you know, their coaches. Probably accurate in one sense, but also, you know, complaining about it isn't going to change it. Brad Marchand is a wizard at knowing where the line is. He gets right up to it. Sometimes he'll cross it, but a lot of times he steps, oh, just put a little bit over. Now come back and now you're pissed off. And oh my goodness. I don't know if you were able to watch much of that game, but oh, if, if you like that style of player, it's hard not to respect it. It was like a Picasso on how to piss off and completely disrupt your opposition. I'm more intrigued at what you think about Sheldon Keefe's comments after the game. It, it, it kind of sticks with a lot of the stuff he said this year. Which is what? Crying and excuse making? A little bit. And I, I would find it questionable. I, I, I Focus on looked... your own team. Like yeah. focus on, on Brad Marchand not scoring is what I'd be looking at instead of whatever calls they are or aren't getting. That's yeah, not going to and... change. And And by the way, you you complaining about it publicly is only going to hurt your case, not help it. Yeah. Whether anyone wants to acknowledge that part or not. Well, if if I'm not mistaken, um, Boston's being shorthanded one more time than Toronto. So just, I think it's 11-10, right? Time shorthanded for uh, Boston to, to Toronto in the series. So Toronto's, you know, 3.3 and Boston's 3.6. So I don't compl- it's it doesn't it's not a good timing look. Um you know yes he's good at it there's no question about it but he also scored a huge goal and then he scored the empty net goal right so he scores two massive goals uh for them at a key time in a game and This is what the playoffs are all about. Yes. Yeah. Like what like I I don't understand the griping. No, like just say hey our guys you got to control your emotions better. You can't, you know, that's, that's the thing for, it's not like it. we're sitting here today. Like if this was David Pasternak, we were talking about today, we'd be like, Oh, I can't believe Pasternak is playing this way. We've never seen it, but this is Brad. Like Brad Marchant is like the poster boy for a guy who's disruptive. You want to call him a rat. You want to call him whatever word you want. People don't like it, but here's the thing. He is, he's, he's going great. to the hall of fame for a reason. Yeah, like he's a great player, but he's also, he's great at one thing that very few guys are. He knows how to absolutely rattle their cages and they got to figure it out. Otherwise they're going to lose the series because they played well for long stretches. And then all of a sudden Marshawn comes in and all of a sudden it's like they completely forget where they are. 
that's a unique ability to get your team off its game. And that is what the playoffs are. That is a tale as old as time. And hey, the other thing I wanted to touch on uh, before I get to Tyler Ramchuk is the Florida Panthers, Frank, 11 consecutive overtime wins. Carter Verhage, now this guy is an absolute beast. He's like a stone cold killer come overtime. And the uh, the Panthers uh, found a way to, to be up 2 nothing in, in that series. And now, no, some would argue series doesn't begin until the home team loses, and that's probably what Tampa Bay is going to say. I wouldn't be shocked if Tampa Bay wins at home, but Florida got off to the start they wanted, and Carter Verhage, man, like, and and just the the ability to win eleven consecutive home games here over the last four seasons for the Panthers, not like they went seven and zero last year in the postseason, and now they win their first one this year. The Lightning are the do they have the best chance to come back from down two nothing, or is it the Stars? Oh, I'd probably say the Lightning because uh, they at least are coming back home. Dallas is going into, you know, an absolute hornet's nest in Vegas. It's a good question. I'd I'd probably lean toward the Stars based on the actual eye test of the first two games. But so I'll I'll, I'll word it this way then. Like, I think we both aren't giving much hope to the uh, uh, Capitals or the Islanders. But which one do you think has a better chance to win one game? Caps? Or range, uh, Caps or Islanders? Islanders, because they probably should have won the first two. Well, I don't know if they win the second game, man. Dude, Carolina. they were up three to one. I mean, they should. Yes. I'm sorry. They, like, you're up three to one. You should. But they gave up everything in that game. Like, 30. Well, I get shots. it, but I don't care. You're up three to one. Win. Now, see, there's the difference, Frank. Um, Carolina has this the uh, NHL record for most combined missed shots and block shots in a game in a playoff game at 71. And then the next night, Vancouver did 68. But the difference was Vancouver only had 18 shots on goal. The Hurricanes had 39, right? So they, they missed the net a lot, but at least they got a lot on net. That Sorry. was the difference, and that's why There's they won. Right? Three nothing, not three one. Yeah. So what was that? If you, for, you uh, if you're, if you're up three, three nothing and and lose five three, like that's on you. I don't care what you did after the fact. You got three goals and you squandered it. You were 81 and, and 0, Frank, as an organization until that game. The Islanders, 81 and 0 when they had a three goal lead in the playoffs. Not good. Not good. Let's uh, let's bring in Tyler Yaremchuk. Ty, how you doing? All right, let's get into things. Fill in the blank. You guys covered all the playoff series. So I want to ask you about uh, the news we got on the coaching front earlier this week. David Quinn fired by the San Jose Sharks after two seasons. Your question is simple. David Quinn getting fired was blank, Frank. David Quinn getting fired was a spent bullet for Mike Greer. This is the guy that he hired. This is we knew was a poor team to begin with. The Sharks seem to be in denial of that when Greer took over, but this is the fifth year that I, th- I think factoring in their 32nd f- place finish, I think they're averaging 29th place in five years. So terrible team. You hire your your guy from Boston that you know, another BU connection, and after two years, you gas him, that's on you. That's not on the players. That's not on roster construction or whatever it is that you, it's not on motivation or that's on the general manager. So I don't think David Quinn changed at all in his couple years coaching the Sharks. I think he got a bad team. He coached a bad team and now he's been fired for coaching a bad team. Yeah. Greg. I'm going to say it's expected based on conversations I had um, with some, uh, some veteran players in San Jose at different times this season. Um, You're right. They do not have a lot of talent. That's totally valid. I was also told by a few of them that they didn't really have a, a coaching structure in place as far as what their, what their defensive system was early on in the season. And um, you know, a few different players voice that uh, to me over our times. And so I'm not surprised by it. Um, you know, most GMs, you'll get two hires. So this one that you're going to have to be a lot better. They're going to, they're going to need a much better X and O coach in there. We all know Frank 
They don't have a lot of talent. Um, I said it last year, like the San Jose Sharks, they were in denial for many years that they were in their rebuild. They kept missing the playoffs. This past year is the first time that it looked, but there's still another seven or eight years of pain in San Jose coming. It's not going to be pretty. Um, you know what? Uh, they hope that they win the uh, the lottery and get Celebrini. You know, that will help them with, with what Will Smith. That would be, they're the they're going to need a lot more. Um to uh, to get that organization going, but um, there there was a lot of um, there was a real focus and ran like it was NCAA, and I think that you know too much of anything isn't a good thing. So I'll be curious to see uh, who they go for as a coach, but I think they're going to need a really technically sound head coach. I I'm like horrified to hear you say structure. Like when I think of that team, that's not the first thing I think of that they need. I'm like they need an era of good feelings. They need everyone to feel like they're playing in the NHL. They need everyone to feel like people care. They need to feel confident. No one there does. It's very country club-esque in terms of, ah, eh, whatever. At least from the players I talk to. And I structure X's and I don't know. Well, but but that's part of it. Like Players like to feel that they're prepared before a game. Right. And when you come in and say, well, let's just play hockey. Well, that's not a that's not that's not invoking a lot of story. Like players are it's in some ways robotic, Frank. They sit in the coaches, okay, play this way, this way, this way. Even if you don't like it, like listen to Drew Doughty. I don't love the system we play, but we need to play it to be successful. And you know exactly what's expected of you. If you don't know what's expected of you, especially when you don't have a lot of talent, well, that's what happens. Yeah. Um, all right. Second one I got for you guys. And this one is a, a little bit of a morbid question, I suppose. Um, but when you look back through the Oilers decade long rebuild, they went through seven head coaches. If you include Mac T who was like the last coach to get them in the playoffs, they went through seven before they finally got back Buffalo right now. If you count Lindy rough now a second time, they're on coach number eight. And for the sharks, I mean, they fired DeBoer in the season. They first missed the playoffs, Bob Bugner. David Quinn, they're on number four. The Sharks will be on coach blank before they get back into the playoffs. Jason? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Oh, my God. Um, so I'm saying another seven years. I'm probably going to have another two years for each coach. Yeah. God, I'm going to say eight. Like, the coach that you hire to get you through the rebuild is very, very rarely the coach who gets to come out the oh. other side. So, like, if this is four you know it's a guarantee they're getting the five, right, Frank? But it's also such an undesirable job. And that was going to be my next one is like, we talked about only 32 of them, that. fellas. Trust me. I, oh, I, I get it. But what I would do if I were the Sharks is hire someone that is coming in knowing full well the expectations. Like, hey, your only job here is to, again, get everyone feeling good. I'd go after someone that has been in a situation like that already that is completely comfortable in himself, basically just saying, if this is what my lot in life is, I'm still one of 32, but my NHL record is going to be absolutely dog shit by the time I get to the other end of it. Didn't Dallas Akins just do that in Anaheim? People felt pretty good there. I mean, like, isn't that exactly the type of guy that you'd want? Yeah, just need someone to plug through the rebuild. All right, a quick edition of Phil in the Blank today. It's brought to you by Bet365, the largest sports betting platform globally. Open an account today and use the promo code DAILY365 to get in on a huge range of markets. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. See you, Jens. So, Frank, essentially, if I basically you want to hire a coach who's, who's like a jobber in wrestling. Right. You know, he's coming in. You know, he's going to lose. That's what he is. Right. It's like, who wants to be the job or head coach of the San Jose Sharks? It, it's more so which guy can be a really good psychologist. Okay. Which guy can support players mentally and confidence wise as they come through there? Yeah. So we'll see. We, uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be fascinating, man. Um, the playoffs have been great. There's always lots of storylines uh, early on. And uh, you know, I look forward to uh, to the games tonight. Uh, we'll see what uh, what happens. Uh, what, by, Florida fan. I was gonna say, by the way, what have you made of Jim Hiller in L.A.? Like, there's so, there's tons of guys coaching for jobs. Sheldon Keefe feels like yeah. every time he opens his mouth the last couple of weeks, he's digging himself a further hole. Well, Jim Hiller, I, I I think if the Kings win, 
I think it's an easy, obviously keeps his job. If they don't win, that's going to be three years. They lost to the same team with the same system. I think they'll have a conversation say, okay, hey, Jim, like, because maybe he doesn't want to coach that. They're like, hey, we'll just bring you in because we keep everything status quo, right? The question will be, because I don't think you can go into next season with the one, three, one and expect to win. It hasn't worked. Like you get to the playoffs and you can't even get out of round one ever. So I think that'll be the internal question of the organization. Do questions need to be asked of Rob Blake? Well, they will be. There's no question. But I don't think because they made the playoffs three years in a row, I'd be surprised. Um, you know, they lose the, you know, the best player in the world every time. So, um, but they're far away because it's not like that team goes on to win the cup. So, uh, or hasn't yet. Um, so I, I think, you know what, I think Hiller is a guy that the players like. There hasn't been a massive difference in what he's done from Todd McClellan. It's a different voice. But I think the question will be, would you want, if he says, yeah, I want to coach here, but I don't want to coach the one three one. Although uh, if they win the series, then they, then if he wins the series, Frank, like mark it down, he's staying, right? But it is possible for a coach to change his oh, scheme. Yeah, and 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 point. by the way, maybe this was Todd McClellan's idea, not his, and he's just sticking with it because that's what the guys already knew. No, 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 that's what I mean. I think that's why they did it. They didn't want to change a whole bunch. So see if it works. Frankie, I hope you feel better. Have a safe trip to uh, Nashville, and uh, we will speak with you after the weekend where uh, ooh, it could be juicy in some of these series. Look forward to it.